about approaching the great throne of God. There's a story of a, a gentleman who was high up in the world of business. He was powerful and strong in, his corporate, in the corporate world. And him and his wife went off on a little bit of a road trip. And as they're traveling through, they, they, they came across a, a very small little gas station in the middle of nowhere. And they stopped to fill up. And the gentleman got out and he, he went for a walk around just to kind of stretch his legs. And he came back. He kind of saw his wife was in quite the discussion with the gentleman who was pumping gas. And he kind of came up, and the gentleman turned to him and told him how much he owed, and he paid, and they got back in the car, and he asked his wife, so what was that all about? You were quite the discussion with him, and he goes, would you believe I, I knew him in high school? In fact, we even dated for a little while. And uh, he kind of looked and he smirked and said, uh, well, boy, aren't you lucky that I came along? If you'd married him, you'd be the wife of a gas station tenant instead of the wife of a popcorn business person. And his wife replied, my dear, if I'd married him, he'd be the director of a company and you'd be pumping gas. <laughs> you know, that kind of catches where we're going to go this morning with Ephesians, that it's not about who we are, it's about who we know. That isn't what the Christian life is all about. It's not about who I am. It's about who I know. And it changes everything. In the book of Ephesians, as we've gone through it, now actually, coincidentally, I've done this sermon series in which I, I took a lot of promises of God. I, I randomly pulled them out and decided which, let God decide which week we were looking at for. I did Ephesians last week and again this week. In Ephesians, it's, it's basically the story a Paul writing to some Gentile believers to let them know that they are welcome in the church because some have come along and said, it's great that you believe in Jesus, great that you're coming along, but you know, you're not really as good as the rest of us. You're in the door, but that's about it. You are not as important as we are. And Paul is right to say, you are welcomed in to the very heart of the gospel. And there is a great mystery that comes with that. Why are those who are unworthy brought into the unspeakable riches of the love of God? A hope that is being made known through the church to the very spiritual and heavenly realms. There's another subject we're looking at and just before what we're going to look at today, the fact that this mystery is being made known to the spiritual realms. See, all this is God's plan. And through God's plan, those who are unworthy are welcomed to the very throne room of God. Not just as an occasional visitor, as a guest, but as part of the very family. We can approach the throne room of God with no fear, no trepidation, regardless of who you are, or what you've done, your failures, your background. You can confidently come to the presence of the Almighty. And the point this whole Christian life is not our, our past. It is not our failures. It is not judgments that others may have against us. That's about the relationship that we have with Jesus. We come to verses 11 and 12. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. This confidence. Imagine the people are getting this letter. They, they live in a city called Ephesus. It's what we call the Ephesians. They're living in this city. They're new to Christ. They're new to understanding God as a whole. And people are coming along and saying, you're not quite good enough, though. Not quite good enough. 
And they get this letter from Paul. Now, Paul, as he's writing this letter, he is in jail. I'm sure automatic thought about somebody being in jail. Now, he's in jail because of his faith, but what would be your general thought if you were getting a letter from somebody in jail? Would you be taking advice from them? I mean, these are people who are being told they're not good enough, getting a letter from somebody who's in prison. <coughs> it doesn't sound like a great start, does it? Go through this letter. Grace is the great equalizer. And it's true for us. You know, there is no one, no one on earth today or if any part of human history more worthy of being in front of God's throne except you. Until you consider Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one who has earned his way there. Nobody in the world has any more right to approach God than you do or I do. There is no one better, there is no one worse. These people are very concerned with what other people are saying and doing because people are looking at them and judging them. They're worried. There's people over here are saying I'm not good enough. There's people thinking that, you know, I don't deserve to be here. And Paul is writing to them saying, you know what? You need an eternal perspective. You need to think about things from God's point of view, not from the point of view of others. You know, people come along and they say things to us or they think things about us, or we think they think things about us. And it's a distraction. It's not where I should be. And Paul is ready to try to get their eyes away from those people who are sitting around saying, you know, you're not good enough. People who are judging and saying, you're not good enough towards what God is saying. And God is definitely saying, you're not good enough, but Jesus is here. You don't have to be good enough. It's not the point. You are welcome into the very throne room of God. Pursue eternal things. And implied in this is a whole thing about that we can come before our eternal God we can come before him in prayer. And Paul's plea to them is pray deep. Pray hard. Pray for freedom for distractions. Pray for a heart that looks like Jesus. Pray the Holy Spirit fills you at an ever-growing rate. Once a month we have a prayer time on Sunday nights at the church. It's tonight, actually, usually the first Sunday of the month. Six o'clock in the fireside room. You are welcome to join us. It's one where we don't just sit around and pray about simple things. We go deep in prayer. And in that deep prayer, we're usually focusing around the Lord's Prayer. And in the midst of the Lord's Prayer is that remarkable phrase, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Be forgiven so you can forgive. And as we focus on being forgiven, we tend to relinquish, or we should at least, all the things that are going to hold us back. If we're going to be forgiven, it's going to lead us to forgive others. Because the things of this world matter a lot less than the things of eternity. We need to over and over come to God and be overwhelmed by his love, by his forgiveness, by his grace to discover what God wants for you. These verses are not just about prayer. They're about seeing myself in eternity. Prayer is a great connection point. Prayer is where we meet God. Often we think it is like begging 
God for attention. Something goes wrong. God, can you do something about this? Can you pay a little attention here? Book of Revelation, the end of the Bible. One of the apostles, John, has this vision. He says this. It's in chapter 5. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, and with seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The imagery here, but hang on. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Listen to this. Tilling a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. A little later on in chapter 8, a couple chapters later, it says almost the same thing. The smoke of the incense, which is the prayer of the saints, rose before God from the hand of the angel. No, prayer is not about getting God's attention. It is God delighting in the fact that he has our attention. That there is a basis for a relationship here. It's all about the fact that I'm relating to God. And, and God looks at that and values our prayers. He values what we have to say for him. It goes before his throne as something beautiful. It's not us trying to say, hey God, can you pay attention to me for a minute? It's a relationship because God desperately wants our attention. And it's our way to show that we're showing attention to God. And through Jesus, we have access to our Father. A little earlier, he uses the word mystery to describe God's approach to those who are unworthy. We love good mysteries, don't we? There's a story of a gentleman who got a ticket to go see a mystery theater. And he got there for opening night quite excited about watching this, this play that was full of intrigue and things like that. And he got to the theater and discovered his seats were terrible. And so he called over the usher and said, Is there any way you can get me a better seat? If you can, i got a great tip for you. Well, that kind of got the usher excited, so he went around and there was no seats anywhere. He went down to the box office. He hung around the box office for a few minutes. After, when there was just minutes left before the play, realized there was perfect, perfect seats sitting right center towards the front that were sitting, somebody was supposed to pick up, they didn't get. So he grabbed the tickets with minutes to go, he went up, he found the guy, said, come with me, took him to the perfect seats. The guy said, thank you so much, and he handed him a quarter. <laughs> the usher said, thank you, then leaned in and whispered, the butler did. <laughs> Spoiled the mystery for <laughs> to know the mystery of why God comes for us. The mystery of God coming for us is not one that is supposed to be a surprise. It's a mystery of the fact that God is, loves us this much. When we pray in desperation to get God's attention, it's not wrong. It's a good start. But you know, the bottom line is God wants to be known and to be seen as our treasure. God wants you to grow in his grace so that you can see himself, see him in the proper way. I have a quote in the, the bulletin that reads like this. In our day and age, we send little text messages to God. Tell this is recently written. Little Twitter messages, 140 characters or less. We put in our little time, yet we want a lot of results. The reality is we need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to know how badly we need it deep within our souls. We must become unsatisfied before we can be satisfied. We must become empty before He will fill us. We must become desperate before He will contentedly fill us. 
requires pursuit. We are saved by grace. It is a gift of God. And once we become saved, though, that doesn't mean everything is easy. We need to pursue the things of God. To discover the deepness of all that he has for us. To chase after him. In times where the church is in revival and growth, it's a time where people have come to realize that there are distractions in this life and they need to be repented of and turn fully to Jesus. And these people who are in this church in Ephesus are being gossiped about. Have you been gossiped about? People are talking about them. Oh, they don't really deserve to be there. They're not good enough. Now, some of it might be, you know how it is, somebody makes a comment and you hear about it, and maybe it gets blown out in their own minds. Maybe it isn't that somebody's thinking about them as much as they think they are. Boy, that pulls you away from the things of God. That, 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 that very quickly fills your sight. It pulls you back to the things of this earth. And in times where the church is growing and successful, it's, it's not a word about what people are saying. But eyes are fully focused on Jesus. That is where our eyes are completely found. <clears throat> Thought People sometimes can consume us. Sometimes distractions from this world can consume the entire church. And instead, God calls on us to repent, to pursue, and to pursue hard the things of Jesus. And the church is most successful often when there's times of immense pressure coming from the world, and instead of seeing that pressure, turns their eyes fully to the throne room of Jesus. Instead of looking at what's going on in this world, is fully looking at Jesus Christ, to discovering within our failures, within our struggles, that our only hope is truly found in Jesus, and we need to keep our focus there. Jesus is everything. So we're going to take some time to move towards communion, to sing a couple of songs to draw our attention back to Jesus. Um, the second one we're going to sing is one that we haven't done very often. It's been a while since we've done it, but uh, follow along. And I'm sure many people will have heard it before. Um, but we're going to start anyways with this chorus of all. So invite our worship team. 